Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, QuickBooks, What's New in 2018 with Greg Bosson. Today we are going to be navigating the new QuickBooks Premier for desktop and re reviewing features and how they apply to you. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. So all callers will be muted. If you have questions, there is a chat box on the left-hand side where you can ask questions and we will try and answer them um, as we go along. And then we will also have a Q&A towards the end. If you lose your Internet connection, just try and refresh your browser and log in again using the link that was emailed to you. Um, there was also a handout that was sent out in the reminder email about 30 minutes prior to the webinar. So if you want to download that, uh, Greg will be referring to that throughout the webinar. Also, if you're interested in watching the webinar again after it's over, it's going to be hosted on the TechSoup website, which is TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinar. And you'll also receive an email with the presentation, the recording, and any necessary links. If you're on social media, feel free to tweet at us using hashtag TSWebinars. And our handle name is at TechSoup. So just a little overview about TechSoup. We are in 226 countries and territories. Uh, we work with over a million organizations providing hardware and software either for free or at cost. Um, so just to try out the chat button, um, if you guys want to tell us where you guys are calling in from, and I can read out a few of the locations. So we have Louisiana, Michigan, Philadelphia, let's see, I'm not seeing anything international yet, but California, Oregon. Okay, so we have people calling in from all over the U.S. it seems, and hopefully from other countries as well. Uh, so we partner with several corporations, Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft, Symantec. So these are the partnerships that help us you know, make our work possible. Um, today's webinar is more focused on Intuit and our partnership with them. And these are the um, offerings that we have on the TechSoup website. And here you can see who's eligible. Um, so if you want more detail, <clears throat> you can just click on www.techsoup.org slash Intuit. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I am the online learning producer here at TechSoup. And uh, Greg Bosson is a practicing CPA and Advanced Certified QuickBooks Pro Advisor with a full service accounting firm located in Atlanta, Georgia. He is also the founder and CEO of QuickBooks Made Easy. And he gives seminars around the country specifically designed for nonprofits. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Greg. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Seema. And uh, first thing, let me go ahead and click this so you can see my little face there. And I like to make sure that everybody can hear me and that it's clear. And I can see the chat. So go ahead and say, hey, I want every single person. And we're up to 528 people on the call. I want everyone to say, hey. This is not your normal webinar, I'm going to tell you right now. We are going to be talking back and forth. I'm going to be asking you questions. You're going to be answering. It's going to be quite exciting. All right, so we've got uh, – oh, Bend, Oregon. We've taught a seminar there in Bend. And by the way, there were people from Canada here. Uh, so I think that counts as another country. Uh, Boston certainly does. Uh, not as another country. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. All right, so it looks like – so there's some people that don't have sound also. So Seema and them in the back end will probably work on that. Uh, Adriana Tenori uh, is one. Uh, but anyway, all right, so I, uh, as Seema said, I'm a CPA, and uh, I specialize in nonprofits. We do audits of probably 30 nonprofit organizations a year all around the country. Somebody here was from Portland. We do the audit for the Portland, Oregon Ballet. But, uh, and then I have about 70 or 80 nonprofit clients. Most of them are here in Atlanta where I am. Uh, and, uh, but then in addition to that, I also own QuickBooks Made Easy. And so what we do at QuickBooks Made Easy is we – teach people how to use QuickBooks from the nonprofit point of view. Okay? And we do this in a number of ways. We have these webinars. We have live seminars that we do across the country. Uh, and then we also have training products. So this is basically the three ways that we teach people how to use QuickBooks. Let me get my little arrow here. 
Arrows are always fun. Can I get my arrow? There we go. All right. So um, we have DVD training products. These are them over here, and they're handbooks that come with DVDs. And we're going to tell you where to go to get them. This set, The Essentials and Beyond the Essentials, is around 16 hours of learning. It teaches you everything you need to know about QuickBooks, um, soup to nuts if you are a nonprofit. Uh, then we also have tech support where you can call me and we'll talk about that. We're going to give you guys a good deal on getting tech support with us if you're interested. And then we do live seminars across the country. So we're still uh, kind of planning where we're going to teach next year. Some of these have already come up. So this is some of our uh, seminars and webinars that are coming up. Um, we've got the webinar in two days on the new uh, QuickBooks desktop users. And that's because a lot of you that are listening are probably new. Uh, in this webinar, we're going to go over the new features, but uh, I bet you a lot of you could, do, could deal with some good just new QuickBooks desktop user learning. And that's going to happen on Thursday through TechSoup. And then here's some of the other cities we're going to be in with dates. Uh, and I think, yeah. So this is one way of learning is to come into the live seminars and, and the uh, webinars. But uh, another way of learning is the training products. And we're actually going to give you – one of the training products is QuickBooks Made Easy, The Essentials, and it's available at TechSoup. We also have one year of unlimited tech support, which we're giving you $300 off. Uh, and then we have um, the three-day webinar series, a, a webinar series if you can't come to a live seminar that's happening in May. But we'll show you these coupon codes at the end. Let's get on, let's get on with it, guys. So I'm going to go to the agenda. So let me just tell you something right now, all right? Um, when it comes to <clears throat> QuickBooks, there's two kind of groups of people. There's the people that are in the desktop and the people that are in the online edition. And this seminar, this webinar is for people in the desktop. And what we're learning here is the new features in 2018. Now I'm going to tell you something right now, guys. QuickBooks doesn't change hardly anything when they go from one version to another. They do change some things. The program only gets better. It doesn't get worse. But if you're in the desktop land, every year they come out with a new version of the software. We're in 2018. And as you can see, we only have one, two, three, four, six features. Now there's a few more, but the few more features are not available in the nonprofit edition of QuickBooks, which is what you have. And they're not something that you would really care about anyway. I try and focus on just the features that are helpful for nonprofits. So because of that, uh, because there's not too many, we also are going to go ahead and cover what's new in version 2017. Because you know, most people when they upgrade, they don't upgrade every year. A lot of people upgrade every other year. So now as I teach these new features, and I'll go through them with you one by one, um, that's the purpose of the webinar. But as I teach them, uh, I'm going to make sure that you understand the background. So I'm going to say what each feature is. Then I'm going to show you the feature. And in doing so, we're going to talk about why it might be relevant for you. And if there's any background for people that are completely brand new to the program and don't know anything, I'll give you the little background too so that you understand what the new feature is serving. Because if you're brand new to QuickBooks and I just show you new features when you don't know the regular features, that's not very helpful, is it? So anyway, so we're going to do it in 18, then we're going to do it in 17. Uh, and we're going to take questions throughout, but we, at the end we're going to have time, I'm hoping a good 20, 30 minutes to do questions on anything that you want in life. Okay, well, hopefully it's related to QuickBooks. Okay? So um, can you show the cost sheet again? I'll show that. Well, I'll show that. Here it is. This is the cost sheet right there. Somebody just asked that. And yeah, Sandy, uh, this is not applicable to you. Uh, she wanted to know if she has the online version. Let's go ahead and cover that now. I'm going to do a poll. I want everybody to answer this poll. What version of QuickBooks are you using? The desktop version, and if so, what year do you have? And then the online edition. And then of course there's probably some people that aren't even using QuickBooks yet. So this is, and it's important, we should have at least 500 people answering. So I want every single person to answer. Uh, don't, don't be listening to anything else. I'm the most important person in your life for the next hour and a, <laughs> an hour and a half. Carlos, Carmela, see I'm calling you out by name. I want to make sure that everybody answers the poll. Um, 
<clears throat> we'll go a little bit longer here, but what I want to tell you while we're waiting for the poll here is the desktop version, that's the one that you download and install on your computer. And typically, unless you have remote accessibility, you have to kind of be at the computer that has the QuickBooks in order to use it. Okay? And that's the one that's been around for years. Then there is the online edition. That's the one second from the bottom in the poll. And if you have the online edition, your program looks completely different. All right? So I'm going to end the poll here. Uh, we've got 420, so we still have about 100 people that aren't responding. That always drives me crazy. David, are you there? David? David? I'm here, Mr. Boston. Yay. Why, didn't, why doesn't everybody answer the polls? Please find that out and get back to me. People are so engrossed with listening to you talk. I think that's what it is. Okay, I'm going to skip to the results, and we can take a look and see that See, there's people doing all different versions of the desktop program. And look, we have 46 people that are in the online edition, and we have, we have 47 people that have never even seen QuickBooks. But I'm going to show you right now just so that you understand. I'm going to share my screen, and I want you to see the difference. So I'm sharing my screen. So David, make sure that I'm – hopefully you should be looking at QuickBooks right now, the little flowchart thing. Does everybody see are. that? David, make sure they see it. Okay, cool. So this is the flowchart. This is the desktop version of QuickBooks. If you have the online edition, your software looks like this, and you are in the wrong place. All right. <laughs> so now if you want to just hang out and listen because I'm a very interesting person, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, but we will have a uh, – we have webinars on the online edition that you can look up at QuickBooksMadeEasy.com, and also TechSoup will be giving webinars on the online edition as well. So, and the other question that always comes up is, should I have have this online edition, or should I have the desktop? So I'll tell you right now, the desktop is better than the online edition. It has more capabilities when it comes to reporting. If you have grants that you need to track that are restricted, a better choice is the desktop. Um, if you don't have grants at all and you don't really have employees and you're a smaller organization, the online edition is fine. But once you get bigger and you need a lot of reporting and you have grants that you need to, be tra need to track, the desktop version is better. Now I will tell you this now, that's the case. But it doesn't matter because five years from now, everybody's going to be in the online edition because that's where the uh, country is going. That's where Intuit is pushing. Everybody is going to have this. This is a cloud-based version of the program. Okay? Either of these, either the online or the desktop, can be purchased from TechSoup. If you buy the desktop, it's $50 for the software, and you can use it as long as you want, although most people upgrade every other year. If it's the online edition, which is this one, it's $50 a year. All right, a whole year. You don't have to pay a monthly charge if you buy it from Intuit. If you buy it here, you could just pay one per year. Okay? So um, now I've got one more poll that I want to do, so I want to share my screen again. I want to find out the level of experience everybody has. So go ahead and tell me what do we've got. We've got never seen it, I'm scared, saw it, closed it, super scared, no QuickBooks, but really not that well. Um, then there's people that know QuickBooks. You've been using it for years, but you've never used it for a nonprofit. And you're in a good space because nonprofits, the setup is very, very different. Uh, and then we have uh, QuickBooks uh, for nonprofits, uh, and you have uh, lots of, uh, I guess, experience with it. I'm not, oh, you have lots of questions. That's what this means. That you know QuickBooks for nonprofits, but you still have a lot of questions. And then there's the QuickBooks master who's just here to heckle me. So uh, now I'm going to say that this is kind of interesting. So there is, it looks like, um, uh, maybe 130 people that kind of know QuickBooks or don't know it at all. Uh, but then there is, I've got 170 people so far that know QuickBooks for nonprofits pretty well and they just have questions. So that's helpful to me because that means we'll be able to move on after we get through with the different features that are new in 2018 and 17, and we can really have a lot of time to answer your questions. So that's kind of cool. I'll skip to the results and show you. So see, there's a lot of people here, almost half 
uh, know QuickBooks for nonprofits pretty well. Uh, so that's, that's kind of cool. That's amazing. So most people that are on the call know QuickBooks pretty well, so that's helpful to me. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to start teaching. And let me go back to the desktop here, and I'm going to share my screen. And I'll just stop for a second. Does anybody have a question about the different versions of QuickBooks, or you were just wondering about something about how to get the program that I could answer? And um, Simo will read me any if there is. Yeah, so we is have, there let's see. Yeah, there's one question. Does using an older version of QuickBooks put us at a disadvantage compared to if it were a more recent version? Uh, okay, so here's the deal with the versions. Every year they come out with a new version, and this is of course just if you're in the desktop. And um, the program has changes, but you're not really at a disadvantage. You can keep the older version unless your version is more than three years old. They have something in QuickBooks called the Sunset Laws, which means Every year they stop supporting a version that's older than three years. So in May of 2018, they're only going to support 18, 17, and 16. So what that means is if you um, have a bug or a problem, and frequently there are bugs if, with your software or with the program, QuickBooks is not going to help you if you're th more than three years old after May. Um, also, if you like to download your transactions, there's this neat little thing where you can download transactions using bank feeds directly into QuickBooks. People use it for credit cards and debit cards a lot. won't work if it's more than three years old. Same thing with payroll. QuickBooks has an awesome payroll service. You can't have it if your version is more than three years old. So, um, and QuickBooks Merchant Service won't work with QuickBooks if it's more than three years old. So, I would say upgrade every three years. Anything else, Seema, before we move on to the different features? Um, somebody was asking nonprofit versus enterprise, if you want to tackle that okay, question. Okay, so sure. So in QuickBooks Desktop, there's actually multiple choices, and I think I actually have it up already. There are five different choices of QuickBooks. And let me just do it this way so that it will – oh, no, it won't let me. Never mind. All right. So we have QuickBooks Pro, which is your basic QuickBooks that you buy at the store and it doesn't come in a nonprofit edition. If you're using it, you're fine. You don't need the more expensive one, which is the nonprofit edition, which is what I'm teaching with. But that is actually cheaper because you can get it, even though it retails for $479, whereas this retails for like $250. The nonprofit edition is the one you can get at TechSoup for $50. So that's the one you should be getting. Now there are some people that have Enterprise Solutions, and Enterprise Solutions is exactly like the program that we're going to teach with. It's exactly like the Nonprofit Edition. It's just more robust. It, 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 it's bigger. It's more powerful. It doesn't really have a whole lot of extra features or anything, and the screens look the same, but Say, for example, your customer list. To get to your customer list, you click here, and this is where you can add customers. Now, the maximum number of customers you can have if you have the Premier Nonprofit Edition is 14,500. But if you have Enterprise Solutions, you can have over 100,000. So if you're using QuickBooks in a network, you can have up to five users in the network at the same time if you have Premier Nonprofit. In Enterprise, you can have up to 30 people in at the same time. So it's for bigger nonprofits. But in terms of teaching today, all these features that I'm going to teach you are available in Enterprise Solutions. Okay? Anybody – is that cool? Did I get that, yeah, I think, Seema? I think, I think so. I think one more question that I'm seeing a couple times. If I'm using the Mac version, will this webinar be of use to me? Uh, Okay, so the Mac version they stopped supporting in 2016. They don't even make the program anymore. So if you are in the Mac version, these new features will not be there because they're new features that were added just a few months ago and they stopped using uh, QuickBooks for the Mac. I'm going to tell you that you either need to get a parallel for your Macintosh and start using the desktop or go to the online edition. Mac is not long for this world. I'm sorry to, hear, to, to tell you that. All right? So, uh, and with that, let me go to the first feature. So this is actually the most exciting feature of all. 
and it's multi-monitor functionality. So what this means is how many of you have multiple screens? I have two computer screens right now. How many of you have more than one? Go ahead and chat. I want to hear how many people like to work with two screens. What do we got? Are people answering Seema? Seema? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Oh, cool. Sorry. Okay. Um, I was you scared me. <laughs> okay, so I see two screens is a must. One screen only has one. <laughs> That's kind of a variety of answers. Okay, because um, I I'm mean, seeing more twos than one though. Yeah, twos are two screens. Cool. Now let me just show you something. As long as you have, and first I'm going to teach what's already there to kind of give you background, and then I'm going to teach you the feature. So. If you click on View, you will see that you can either look at one window or multiple windows. If yours is at one window, you can only see one window at a time. But if yours is on multiple windows like mine is, then you can see multiple windows. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a balance sheet, and I'm going to pull up a P&L. All right. So now I've got a balance sheet, and a P&L. Now you see they're both on the same screen, but they're kind of covering each other up. Now I will tell you something that's also been around for years before I get into the new feature. If you click on Window, you can actually tile these things. If I tile vertically, then they fill the one screen so you can see them at the same time. But if you have more than two screens, that doesn't work very well. So if I opened up another screen, uh, like maybe a right check window, and I went to tile these vertically or horizontally, it, it, it really isn't very helpful. So this is when you kind of want to have, you want to be able to move things onto the next screen. And you can't see both of my screens, but I'm telling you when I do this, it doesn't appear on my other screen. And that's how it is in 2017 back. In 2018, they added this new feature. So here we go. So it's up here in View. So you click View, and it's called Switch to Multi-Monitor multi Mode. Switch to Multi-Monitor Mode. When you click it, this window pops up, and it automatically reads how many monitors you have. And I have three monitors. And it's wild because it knows that this one is gigantic, which is why it appears much bigger than the other two. So what it wants you to do is select up to three monitors that you can look at QuickBooks between. So I'm just going to select these two. And then I'm going to click Proceed. So then what happens is, I'll close this. Then what happens, and I, I wish you could see this, but, but you can't. But now when I click this and I move it, it does appear on the other screen. And I can't show you that, unfortunately. Now, you'll also notice this little arrow um, right there that appears once you turn the feature on. And that's another way of kind of clicking it, and it moves it over to another screen. But I think that's kind of stupid because you can just move it over manually anyway. All right? So that's kind of the deal with that. And you can turn it off just as easily as you turn it on. So I'll just switch it back on. Uh, and let me move this back over here where we were. All right, so uh, that is the multi-monitor. So does anybody have any questions about that? That's the first new feature in 2018. I think, uh, I think we're good. Yeah, that one's pretty basic. What do you all think about it? Is anybody into it? Is it cool? Is it not? Personally, I'm into it. Who is very excited about it? Yeah, a lot of <laughs> so cool. Love it, like it. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, thumbs that's up. it's it's a neat thing. It's a neat thing. Okay, we got a thumbs up, so that's good. All right. So the next one, this is so funny. Sometimes they put in a feature, and it's like, why did they do that? Like I've been struggling to figure out what the benefit of the feature is, but let me tell you what the feature is. Okay, for those of you that are new, let me explain something to you. The, in QuickBooks, there are these things. They're called lists. And lists have to be set up correctly before you ever enter transactions. And then you can get the good reports that you want. So one of the lists, for example, is the customer list, and one of the lists is the vendor list. And, and if you are in the customer list, I'm showing you things that are already in play now, and then I'll show you the feature. Say I was in this list and it has all my customers. 
And I want to look for, you know, I don't want to scroll up and down. I can use this search feature that's been here for a long time. So say I know the person is named Jack. So I don't have to put the whole name. And I just click this little magnifying glass, and it finds everybody that has the name Jack. Okay? They didn't have that, – that feature has been around for years. And it's in, the, it's in the customer list. It's in the vendor list. New for 2018, it's in the chart of accounts list. And the chart of accounts is probably the most important list of all. Uh, but they added it in 2018. Here's a little thing right here. Look for account name or number. So you can search using names or numbers. And actually, I want to change to a different data file with, that I have some numbers in. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, we'll do this one. All right. So, uh, uh, and the, the thing that I've struggled with is who cares? You know, <laughs> why is it that we would want to search that way? Uh, we would want to search. Well, you know, if you have a chart of accounts that's set up correctly, it really shouldn't be very large. But a lot of people don't. They've kind of set things up wrong. I know a lot of you were inherited a mess. And so your chart of accounts list is really long. And we talk in our main uh, seminars and our 3 day webinars and our training on how to properly set up a chart of accounts. But if you have a ton of accounts, finding the account that you're looking for can be kind of tough because you have to scroll. Uh, as you can see, I'm wasting time while this thing opens. Sorry about this. Uh, but uh, so now they've got this new search feature. Uh, and when I, if this would ever finish, then I can show you the feature. It looks like I'm stuck. I don't think I've ever had it take this long. I think I may have to. Let me push this thing and see if I can. Nope. All right. Why don't we take a couple of questions while I'm fixing this? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one question we have is, can we use customer lists to track members and donors? Uh, oh, cool. That finally happened. Customer list to track. Yes. That's exactly what the customer list is for. It's for tracking donors, members, and students. That's perfect. Glad that okay. you glad you knew that. So I'm going to go back to the chart of accounts list now, and I think this one has numbers in it. Yeah, it does. So why would we need this? Well, let's say that you have a you have a number of accounts that have kind of been duplicated. Say an account supplies, and you have like three or four supply accounts, and you're thinking, you know what? I want, kind of want to see what all of my supply accounts are. Maybe I'll inactivate some or merge some. If I push Supplies and click Search, then it gives me all the accounts that just have the word Supplies somewhere in there. Additionally, if you can look by number, if you know the number, you can look by number. All right? And by the way, since I mentioned it, uh, so that's the new feature, this thing here. But since I mentioned it, a lot of people want to know how to merge accounts. You have an account here called Office Supplies. You have another account here called Other Supplies. These are actually used interchangeably. You came here and you, you started using the books and you don't know which one to use, and so you, sometimes you put it here and sometimes you put it here. You can merge these two. Now there's not really a merge button, but what you can do is you decide which one you're going to keep. So let's say I'm going to keep Office Supplies. And then you take the other one, you edit it, and you change the name of it to the name of the one you're going to keep. So I'm going to change the name to Office Supplies. Okay? Now I'm going to keep this number here, the old number, and we'll click Save. And this is where it says, this name's already being used. Do you want to merge them? So I click Yes, and I want you to keep your eyeballs right over there. When I click Yes, now there's just Office Supplies, and you see how it kept the number of Office Supplies and removed the number of other supplies. Okay? So when you do that, it merges the names, and it also merges the transactions in the future and the past. Now that's been there all along. I just threw that feature in. But that's the new feature up here, So uh, this search field. So let's move on. So what, do we have any questions about that before we go on to the next new feature? It says, let's see, we have a couple. Um, why are the numbers before the list name? 
So in other words, why if their numbers do they appear first? Yeah, I'm not sure. You'd have to ask QuickBooks. Yeah, there, you'd have to ask okay. QuickBooks. That's just a decision that they've made. Okay, and then another one is, can you only merge accounts in 2018 or in earlier versions? You can again, as I was saying before, you can merge accounts in older versions. The new feature is this one up here where you can look or search for an account. But since I said you might want to do it so that you can get accounts that are very much the same so you can merge them, I taught the merge feature. But the merge feature has been available for years. All right? Okay. Cool. Yeah, I think all right. Good. So we'll move on now. Um, and uh, first of all, I got two questions. Uh, how, or how are you all feeling about this? Is this going too fast, too slow, just right? What are you thinking? Give me, a, give me an honest thing because we're just a little bit in and I can speed it up or slow it down. How's everybody feeling? What do we got, Seema? Uh, we've got good, just right, and too slow. So it's kind of a combination. <laughs> of <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not good. I think I'm seeing more uh, just right, so I think we're, I think we're on track. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And listen, guys, the people that feel like this is too slow, and I know there are a few of you, it's because you know QuickBooks pretty well. And you are going to get plenty of time to ask all sorts of wild and detailed questions because we're going to have time at the end of this. So just hang with me, all right? All right. Now the next feature has to do with those of you that invoice, all right? So I'm going to pull up an invoice. And, you know, nonprofits, they, a lot of them do invoice. Maybe you invoice for services provided like uh, tuitions or membership dues. Uh, maybe you have a workshop fees that you invoice for or registrations for an annual meeting or whatever. There's all sorts of stuff. Okay? So here we have an invoice. Now, when you enter an invoice, and again, we, we could spend an hour teaching you invoices, but there's a new feature related to invoicing, and that is a past due stamp all right, that was never there before, and now it's there. So let me explain this to you. This invoice is obviously not past due. The date is June 30, 2020. But I'm going to make this date June 30, 2015 so that it's really, really old. Okay. And let me go ahead and save that change. And when you change it, you see how now you have a past due uh, 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 word that appears here on the invoice. Now that is new. Okay, That is not completely what I wanted to teach you. That's kind of cool. But what stinks about it, check this out guys, check this out. Even though the past due stamp is here, when you go to print it, and I have to move this over here so you can see it. When you go to print it, the past due stamp is not on the printed copy, and it's also not on an email copy. Because see, you can print or email these things. So it's kind of like, who cares if you have a past due stamp if it's not on the printed or emailed copy? So what they've done, in addition to add the, adding the past due stamp, is they have added the ability to make this print on the actual invoice. Now in order to get it to print, and this is where I've got to teach you a little bit, this form is called a template. Right over here, template. And I created this template. It's called membership invoice. But there's a bunch of different forms on here. It's all an invoice, but these templates control what it looks like when it comes out of the printer or attached to an email. All right. So I'm going to go back to this uh, uh, membership one. So if you want this to print, you have to change the template. So your templates are actually in a list. So I'm going to go to Lists, and I'm going to go to Templates. And when I click it, you'll see here's all of your templates for your various invoices. I'm going to find the one that I created called Membership Invoice. See, you, you can have more than one template. Indeed, many of you probably do. If not, you should. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this, and in the template, you will see a feature right here, Print Past Due Stamp. Select when you want to include the past due information stamp in the printed or emailed copy. So I'm going to check that. Click OK. Click OK. So 
Now when I go to print this or attach it to an email, and I've got to move this over from my other screen for you to see it, it says Past Due. Now the first thing I wanted to do was make this Past Due bigger and make it red. And I already tried it, and you can't. Okay, So <laughs> that's the answer to that question. But uh, anyway, it's still pretty cool. Now there's one more thing about the Past Due. Since I turned it on for the template, it's actually going to appear on everybody's invoice if they're past due. And the past due is based on this date that you put here, the due date. Now, if I am going through these things and there's a particular customer who's past due, but I've already called them and I don't want to be obnoxious, I can turn it off. When you turn it off, it will turn off just for this particular invoice so that when I go to print it or email it, it won't be there. But on new invoices, it will still be there. So in other words, it just lets me change it on the one. If I wanted it to be removed globally, then I've got to go back into my template and do it there. Uh, and yes, it works on invoices as well. And I think that's it. So who's got a question or questions on that one? All right, so one question is, so you can leave the box checked and it won't print if it's not past due? Question mark. Correct. Does that make sense? So it, okay. so yes, it does. So basically what he, what he or she is saying is that right here, you can leave this box checked. It's not going to print past due unless it really is past due. And it determines whether or not it's past due. Well, you know what? I'm going to give you this. There's, there's a little bit more about this. It determines when it's past due based on the date that's here or the date that's here. And you determine that in your preferences. So QuickBooks has all these little features. They're called preferences. And you can turn them on or off at will. But if you go to uh, the Edit menu, this is where your preferences are. We're going to go down to Preferences. And the preferences, there's so many of them that they're broken up into different categories. And if I go to – I'm trying to remember where this is. Uh, it may be on Reports. Here we go. Reports. You see where it says age from due date, age from transaction date? Actually, you know what? This is for reporting purposes only. So I have to change my mind on this. I think that whatever the due date here on the actual invoice is, this determines whether or not it's past due. Okay? But since I had went ahead and mentioned it, there is a report in QuickBooks that many of you that do invoicing may look at. It's called an AR Aging Summary, and it tells you what your uh, receivables are, whether they're current or past due. This report is based on that preference that I just showed you right here. Either you age from the due date or age from the transaction date. It only, this is relevant only for reports though. So if you pick age from the due date, which is what I would think you would pick, it's past due after the date that's over there. But if you age from the transaction date, then it ignores the due date for purposes of reporting. But it doesn't ignore the due date for purposes of this new feature, which is the past due stamp. So now that I've thoroughly confused you, uh, let me stop and see who has, uh, if there's any more questions about that before we move on. Sure. Yeah. So somebody's asking, um, they said this is a neat feature. Do they have that for paid? Oh, like yes. They have a paid stamp, yes. And that's on the template as well. So let me go up to Edit and – uh, oh, lists, I mean, templates, and here, and I believe, here we are, print status stamp right here. Select to include the status on the form. Various statuses are paid, pending, received, void, and so on. So that's, that's it right there. Next question. Okay. And that one's been um, around. Somebody is asking, if you are using a multi-user system, is this an individual or company setting? Uh, so, okay, this is what she's referring to. She wants to know if you change this setting, 
Does it change just for the user, or does it change for all people? It changes for all people, not just the one person. Okay? See, there are certain features called preferences. Here they are, and I just mentioned it. And they're broken into these different areas. But for each area, general, there's the preferences, checking, there's the preferences. You'll notice there's a my and there's a company. Company preferences change globally. My changes for the individual user. And I think that may be what this person was thinking about, perhaps. But that is not relevant when it comes to this, because this isn't a preference at all. This is a change in a template, and the template is used by all users. All right, so if there's nothing else, I'm going to move on. I think there's, we one, good? there's one question that I'm seeing a couple times, and I think you might have sure. heard it. Um, but they're asking, does this also work the same for balance due? Let's say someone only pays part of their invoice. When printing, can it show the amount that is remaining? Oh, so when you reprint an invoice that's been partially paid, um, it does show the remaining balance. Uh, in order to make that happen, lists, templates, you want to make sure – we've got to go to this additional customization. You want to make sure – go down to the footer tab, and you want to make sure that you have payments and balance due checked. Payments and balance due. So then it looks like that. Okay. Now the past due stamp, a question that I have is even though they've partially paid, does the past due stamp still happen if you've partially paid it? And the best way to figure that out is to see. So let me, let me go ahead and receive a payment on this because right now it says past due. I would think if you did a partial payment, it would still be past due. So let me go ahead and receive a payment here. Um, and I'm going to just receive a payment for 50 so that there's still something outstanding. Great. It still says past due. When I reprint it, uh, I must have turned the feature. Now that's – oh, hold on one second. Uh, print preview. Oh, I think I have to save this. All right. Now that's interesting. The past due disappeared. Oh, I had to turn it on. Whoops. Okay, now let me try it. There we go. Yeah, the past due is still there, even though it's been partially paid. All right, anybody else? I think we've spent enough time on this one. I'm yeah, going to move on if it's okay with yep. you. Okay, okay, cool. That was a lot. Um, all right. Okay, so let's see. This one is <laughs> – I spent like 20 minutes trying to figure out why anyone would need this one. But anyway, so what this has to do with is if you – on your sales forms, like an invoice, if you're invoicing, or in my training we teach you how to use a sales receipt form to enter donations. Now on the little, uh, uh, on the little homepage here, it's called Donations in the Nonprofit Edition, but it's actually – just a sales receipt. And sometimes they've changed the name here to where it says donation, but this is a sales receipt. And this is where typically people go to enter donations. So if you enter a donation, and again, this is where I would need to teach the new users a lot, but you have to set up a list called an items list, and this is where you enter your individual uh, donations or income, whatever it is may be, that, that it may be. So let's say we had um, memberships. We'll do memberships. This description, okay, it came from the item list. When you set up your items – let me go to my items here – you put a description here. And that's the default description that appears when it appears on a form. So far, I haven't gotten to the new feature yet. So let's say uh, that you put a description. Uh, you, you put a unique description, 2018. 
Well, let's say that this person paid multiple memberships for multiple people. So I'm going to pick this same item again, and the description from the first doesn't copy to the second, and I have to sit and retype it right there. So it, I guess what I'm saying is if you have multiple items that all have the same description, and you need them, and they're a unique description. They're not a description that's, in, that's global, but it's just for this particular person. It becomes difficult because you keep having to retype it. So what QuickBooks has done is they've got a new feature where you can copy not just one field on a row, but you can copy the entire row onto another line, either on this sales receipt or on another. So I'm going to click on this, and I, I can really click anywhere on the line. Let me go ahead and point it to a class too. We use classes in the nonprofit world for our programs, admin, and fundraising. That's how we're supposed to track our programs. But anyway, if I push Control Alt Y, Control Alt Y, it makes a copy not just of that one field, but of the entire line. I'll go down to the next line, Control Alt V, and it copies the entire line. So trying to figure out when this would be helpful is tough for me. Perhaps if somebody in the chat window can come up with a reason why it would be helpful. Um, and then also, uh, let me try that again. Control Alt V. So once you paste it once, it forgets it. So you still have to Control Alt Y. It was Y, right? Yeah. Y makes a copy of it. And then I want to see, I'm kind of testing on the screen here, if you can copy it to other Control Alt V. Nope. It's only within the same form does it work. So that's, it, it, I think it's kind of inane. I'm sure somebody has a reason why they might like it. But basically, it's a keyboard shortcut that allows you to copy entire rows within a form. Uh, does anybody have a question about it? Or can anybody come up with a good reason? Is there anybody that's listening that go, oh my God, that's exactly what I've needed? Because uh, I'm curious to know when it would make life easier for you. What do we got, Seema? All right, let's see. Um, great for deposits when you're doing memorials. I would like oh, – let's see, it's going really fast. I would like – So it doesn't HBO. work – hold on, it doesn't, it doesn't work in the Make Deposit window. Okay. It doesn't work in this window. Somebody's asking, uh, does right it here. work when entering bills? No. It works on invoices, estimates, well, here it works on basically your sales forms. It works on the invoice. It works on an estimate, which you probably don't use if you're a nonprofit. Um, and it works on sales receipts. Uh, and it works on sales orders, which is actually a neat way of tracking pledges without it affecting your books. Uh, and it works on credit memos, purchase orders, and timesheets. It does not work on a bill. It does not work on a check. Sorry. Isn't that kind of crazy? Okay. Yeah. You want to move good. on? I yeah, I think we're good. Okay. I mean, some of these features are kind of lackluster, but isn't it interesting listening to me, right? It's 2.49. Uh, let me teach one more little thing, and then we'll have our – or have our, actually, you know what? I've got to switch data files. So I'm going to go ahead and have the poll. And uh, so let me go ahead and pick out this next poll. And this is – all right. So five, there are five facts here. One of them is false, and all the rest of them are true. One is all dogs are banned from Antarctica. You have to guess which one is false. So guess which one is false. Iguanas have three eyes. Hares are actually born without hair and are naked. Um, there are one million dogs that are the heir of their owners in the will. The will gives all the money to their dogs. Uh, and then finally, if you're dealing with mosquitoes, 
catnip is actually 10 times more effective than DEET. So one of these five is not true. And I want all of these people to answer. I'm going to call out somebody. Uh, how about Hillary? Hillary, are you there? Chat me up if you're there. I want to see Hillary. Say hello if you're there. I'm going to switch. <laughs> Hillary, is, does she say anything? I want to make she sure doesn't she want to say hello. Hello. <laughs> Hillary? Yes. Yeah, she's, oh, she's here. Okay, cool. I love that. How about Maureen? Maureen, are you there? <laughs> Maureen. Maureen. Yeah, there she is. There. They really yeah. are listening to me. That's amazing. All right, let's get to the results. The one that is false, well, you guys think it's iguanas. So, David, you did this poll, so you want to let them know? Uh, iguanas actually do have three eyes. One is just to determine different shades of light and shadow. So what's the false one? The false one are hares are born naked without hair. They're actually born with all of their hair on them. All right. There we have it. Isn't that wild? I think that's weird that all dogs are banned from Antarctica. Why is that? Because they're afraid that they're going to bring diseases to the seals. Oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody knew that, by the way. Somebody knew that answer. They chatted up. I can't remember who the person was, but anyway, all right. Okay, somebody asked me to teach how to do a thank you letter in QuickBooks, so if we have time, but that's a long topic. All right, so let's move on. So um, the next feature that's new, and we only have like four or five more features that are new, has to do with payroll. Now, if you have payroll, and I assume most of you do, you either are with an outside payroll company like Paychex or ADP, or you're using the QuickBooks payroll service, which means you go into employees, and you click the employee center, and you can go over here to uh, the payroll center, pay employees, and you can pay employees from here. And you pay using uh, the little paycheck screen. Who does that now? Check, uh, chat me up. I want to see how many people, because this feature is only relevant if you have this, if you're entering paychecks here, you use the QuickBooks payroll feature. Just chat yes or no or whatever if you do. I want to see. Yes, there's a lot of yeses on this one. Awesome. This, yeah. Let me tell you something. One of the coolest things about the payroll feature in the enhanced payroll is that it allows you to split your paycheck between different grants and different programs. It's really very, very cool. And that's not the purpose of the seminar here. We teach it in the other one. But if you are, uh, if you need to split your payroll between different uh, programs and grants, which a lot of you do, the desktop is a great way of doing it. And this is where you would put your grants here. It's actually quite cool. But anyway, the point that I want to make is that those of you that use the enhanced uh, payroll, let me just cancel out of this. All right. Uh, QuickBooks has had a little tab in the Payroll Center that tells you when your payroll liabilities are due. Here they are. And anything that's past due has this little red uh, circle thing with the exclamation point. What they've added new, so that's been around for years. This is just kind of a little reminder. What they've added is in 2018, they took this little reminder and they put it over here right on the home page. So if you are, it used to be if you were late on your payroll liabilities, the only way you knew was to click on the payroll center up here, and then you'll see it. But now you can see it right on the home page because it has a little thing right there. Not a big deal, but there you have it. Does anybody have any questions about that before we move on? I think we're okay for now. Yeah, I didn't think that would be a very exciting one, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, so now the next one, <laughs> the next feature, it's so funny because usually when I teach guys, I'm trying to cram so much into a small uh, uh, chunk of time, but this time there's just not that many new features. So, all right, but we'll have time at the end for lots of questions. So, all right, uh, 
The rest of the new features have to do with reporting in QuickBooks. All right? So I'm going to pull up a report. And let's see, the first thing that I want to do is pull up a, just a regular old profit and loss. Pull up a regular old profit and loss. And uh, let's see, I will make it. I've got to have a, uh, some numbers in here. So I'll make it from July 1 to June 30, 2020. All right. So this new feature has to do with how to customize reports. Now, let me explain something to you. QuickBooks has all kinds of reports. I mean, there's hundreds of them. If you go into reports, here's a bunch of these, and a bunch of receivable reports, and a bunch of sales reports. There's a ton of them. Yet somehow you still can't find the exact one that you're looking for. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to pull up something that's close, and then you customize it. You change it around. You change the title. You take away the things you don't want. You add the things you do. You add columns, whatever, in order to get it to be exactly like you like it. All right? So that's kind of how that works. You customize reports. Now in QuickBooks Desktop, uh, it used to be the only way to really customize a report was to push on this Customize Report button here. And then there's all kinds of things that you can do, and we're going to look at a couple of those things. But they've taken some of the things that you can do, and they've put it directly on the top of the report in this little ribbon. They call it a ribbon right here. There's actually two ribbons. There's this ribbon up here where you can do some stuff, and then there's this ribbon down here. So say, for instance, you wanted to change the date range of the report. Well, I could click Customize and change the date range. But I could also change the date range right here. Stuff that you got to do a lot, they say, you know what, we don't want to make them push the customize, we'll stick it here. Okay? Now, one thing that's new for 2018 is the report basis. Now, the report basis, I'm hoping you understand this. This is kind of an accounting thing. There are two bases that reports appear in, accrual and cash. This one's an accrual. And an accrual-based report includes all your receivables and payables. So if you invoice out of QuickBooks, and it sounds like a number of you do, if you run a P&L, your outstanding invoices are going to be here even though you hadn't received them yet. Okay? And if you enter bills before you ever pay them, your outstanding payables will be here before you ever spent it. So basically, you're all your receivables and payables will be included on the P&L. Now because it's there, an accrual-based P&L is really valuable, but it doesn't really show you very much about how much money is in the bank. If you want that one, you want to get a cash basis. Then only the money in and money out will appear. So it used to be that you had to push the Customize Report button to get to where you would change from accrual to cash. Click it. Here's accrual. Here's cash. But now in 2018, they added it directly onto the face of the report. So I can switch back and forth from accrual to cash just like that. That's the new feature. Uh, so does anybody have any questions about that feature before we move on? Yes, there's a couple questions here. So um, how did you get the account number to hide in the P&L? Ah, <laughs> well, this data file, I don't have account numbers turned on, and that's why the account number is not appearing. But uh, I'll use this as an opportunity to teach her something that's going to make her really excited. So uh, to turn the account number feature on, you go into the Preferences, and you go to Accounting, and you click Use Account Numbers. Now when you click it, if there are account numbers, they'll appear. Now there isn't any account numbers here, so I need to add some. Let me go to the chart of accounts and I'll add a number. Oh, there we go. There's account numbers. Let me refresh this. There we go. There's the account numbers. So what she's saying is, and this is unrelated, she's like, you know, Greg, I like using account numbers, but I hate that they appear on the reports. So let me give you a trick, okay? You're going to love me after this. So um, we're going to go to our preferences, and we're going to go to reports 
and graphs. And we're going to go over to Company Preferences. And if you look right here, you'll see something that says Show Accounts By Name, Description, or name and description. Right now it's set to name, and the name includes the account number. But if I click Description, then only what appears in the description will appear on the report even if you have account numbers turned on. So what people do, and we'll just pick this one, Salaries and Wages. In your chart of accounts list, we'll go down to Salaries and Wages, and here they are. I'll edit the account, and in the description, I'll put the name of the account over again. Of course, you'd have to do this for each account. So then in this preference here, I'll pull up the preference again, under Company, if this says Name, then it's going to have the account name, and it's also going to have the number move it. It's also going to have the number. But if I make this description, then it's only going to have the description. So even though the number appears, when I go to do reports on this, let me refresh it. Keep your eyeballs on salaries and wages. I've got to refresh. Wait, did I not? Hold on. <laughs> Don't you love it when you try something and then it doesn't work? Uh, edit. I think maybe I didn't save that. There we go. I didn't save it. So now the account number is gone. So does that answer your question? And what do you all think? Because that was kind of that was intense. We good? I think we're good, yeah. Okay, cool. Anybody else got another question before I move on to the next topic? Uh, I think we're okay for now. Okay, cool. All right. So that was all the features that are new in 2018. Now there are a few more, and, but they're not features that are relevant for you. Either you can't use them at all in your data file because you don't have the right version of QuickBooks, or they're just not relevant for you. But they're listed in uh, the little handout that uh, I, I gave to SEMA, and you all should be able to download that. Um, and I'm not talking about the handout of our PowerPoint slides. I'm talking about the new features in 2018. It's a PDF file that she created. Um, and did, did you send that to them this morning, Seema? I did, yeah. So it went out 30 minutes okay. before the webinar, and it's on the right-hand okay. side of the email that says Downloadable Files. And we'll, we'll send it out okay. afterwards as well. All right. So now what I want to do, the rest of what I'm going to show you, and it's not a whole lot, and then we'll start with the questions, is new features that were new in 2017. Because a lot of you that upgraded to 18 upgraded from an older version. So I'm going to show you four more features, and they're all new for 17 and up, and they all relate to reports. All right? So what I'm going to do, first thing I'm going to do is I need to teach a little bit of background here. So and we teach this in our regular uh, seminars and webinars to teach people how to use QuickBooks. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to use the class feature in QuickBooks for your various programs, admin, and fundraising. And then when you enter transactions, I could teach for a second, and then I'll show you the feature. Here's where you can put the expense account postage, and here's where you can put the class that it relates to, Guidance Center. And that way you can track both things, liability insurance. Well, actually this would be for postage. I wanted to show you that you could split a transaction between multiple classes if you needed to. So if you use that feature, you can look at a standard P&L, but you can also look at a P&L by class and it gives you a column. Can you see how powerful this would be? You could look at each one of your programs as its own department or cost center and get a P&L for each one of them. Okay? That's not a new feature. That's been around for years, the class feature. What's new has to do with something called filtering on reports. So I'm looking at a P&L. And I can see the different classes, but let's say that I just want 
the Guidance Center. I just want a P&O for the Guidance Center class and nothing else. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and make this total only. If you go over here to Customize and you click Filter, now the filter, this isn't new either. This has been around for years. I can click Class. And then I can filter it. And, and the way that filtering works in QuickBooks is you put in what you want filtered into a report, and it filters everything else out but that. So it kind of works the opposite from the way that you would think. Okay? So it filters in, not out. So I say, just give me the transactions that I pointed to the Guidance Center class. And then it gives me a P&L just for the Guidance Center. None of that is a new feature. None of it. What's new in 2017 is that if you had this report up, and maybe it was a memorized report, and you looked at it and you didn't know what the filters were that created it, you had to go over to Customize and Filters, and then you can see what the filters are. But starting last year, they, the same place they put this report basis on, they put a Show Filters button. So if I click it, it shows me all of the filters that went into creating this report. And not only can I see them, but say I want to remove the class one, I'll exit, and now it removes the class. So it gives you flexibility, uh, particularly with reports that are memorized, uh, to allow you to see what the filters are and then remove filters that you would like to remove. I'm going to click Hide to hide this again. So I'm going to stop and see how you all feel about that. All right, let's see. Somebody's asking, is there a find and replace option? For example, <clears throat> the ability to change 2017 no. to 2018 in a memorized journal entry. No, there's not a find okay. and replace option in QuickBooks. Okay. Uh, could you go over the use of purchase orders? I think this is Whoa. A broader question. Wow, that's trippy. Real quickly, yeah. <laughs> I will show you these, and then we'd have to get into it in more detail. So here's what the deal is. Purchase order, first of all, it's a feature that you have to turn on. And I'm not even sure that I have this turned on in the system. So I'm going to go to Edit, Preferences. And if you go to the area that's called Items and Inventory, because usually purchase orders have to do with inventory, and you go to Company, click, click Inventory, and Purchase Orders are Active. This turns the feature on. And basically what purchase orders are, are basically like a pre-bill. Okay? So basically what it is, is if you engage with a con in a contract with somebody and you're going to pay them over time, but you want to make sure that you don't pay them too much, you would enter a purchase order so that you uh, later on uh, when you receive a bill, you mark it against the purchase order. So I'm just going to do this real quickly here. A purchase order, again, it's like a pre-bill. Now let's say we engage with Alliance Heating. Well, actually, let's say it's a contract that you had with somebody, Alex Thomas, to do some development work for you. Now notice how there's no place to put an account. You have to use that same field that you use on sales forms. It's called an item form an item field. So what you'd have to do if you're going to use purchase orders is you're going to have to create items for your expenses. So I'm going to create a new item, make it a service item, and I'm going to call it, um, let's see, consultant. That's just the name of the item. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to point it to whatever expense account I want this to go to. So I'm going to point it to contract labor. Now that I've got this item, I can use it on a purchase order. Now you might think, well, why can't I just put an account on a purchase order? It's because the only people that use purchase orders in real life are construction contractors for the most part. Uh, and they need the different items for all the various things that they buy. But anyway, I'm going to click on this. I'm going to click Consultant. And then I'm going to say that I'm going to put $1,000 is what it is that I've agreed to pay them. Save and close. So then later on when I get the bill, 
If I just enter a bill, I'll just enter a bill. If I push that same person, and I can't remember who I did. I think it was Alex Thomas. You get this window. Open purchase orders exist for this vendor. Do you want to receive against them? So this keeps you from paying a bill that somebody hasn't already approved. So I click yes. Here's the PO. I click OK. It copies it to the bill. I click save and close, and then I move on from there. And I want to see whether or not it will do it with checks as well, um, if it will recognize it. It does. So you don't even have to enter a bill. That was way off topic, but somebody's happy about it. Uh, anybody else got a question? All right, let's see. Um, seems like I can't put items in the expenses, the only income, or maybe it's the reverse. Is there a reason? No, you can point items to an expense account or to an income account or both. All right, let me show you what I mean. And I did not know I was going to be going down this road, and it takes a long time, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. So I really want you guys to encourage, encourage you to get some learning on overall QuickBooks, and we'll, give you, we'll, we'll show you where to go to get that stuff after we're done. But anyway, um, what this person is saying is when you're on an invoice or on a donation, uh, you've got to use items. And if you go to your item list, you'll see that when you create an item, items point usually to an income account. But you can certainly point an item to an expense account, um, which I think I just did, didn't I? Uh, I know I spelled that wrong, but whatever. Contract labor. So you can point it to an expense account. And once you point it to an expense account, even if you're not using purchase orders, even on a check, you'll see that there's a tab called Expense, which is what everybody uses, but there's also a tab called Items. And you can click on Items, and then you can pick your item, and it will basically point to the expense account that the item is related to. Now, what some people do if they have things that they, they buy and then they turn around and sell, then what they do is in the item list, they'll create an item, and then you see this little box here that says this service is used in assemblies or performed by a subcontractor or partner. A lot of words. Who knows what it means? But if you check it, instead of being able to point just to an income account or just to an expense account, you check this box, you can point it to both. You can point it to an expense account over here and an income account over here. And the benefit of that is you can use the same item on an invoice as you can on a check or a bill. And when you use it on an invoice, it goes to this income account. And when you use it on a check or a bill or a purchase order, it goes to this account. Whew. All right. I want okay. to finish because we're, really we're really getting into things not related. So let me, let me finish this real quick, and then we'll take more questions. So uh, reports, I just wanted to show you. So, so far when we looked at the report, uh, we were looking at a P&L report. We showed you um, this, this new feature here, the cash versus accrual, and then we showed you the little filter feature. This one's new for 18. This one's new for 17. Now I'm going to go to a different report and show you another feature. It has to do with filtering. If you use the sales receipt window, which is called donations here, but if you use that to enter your individual donations, or you use an invoice, then you can look at these sales reports and really effectively use QuickBooks as a great donor database. I'm going to click Sales by Customer Detail. And this report gives you a list of all of your donations by donor. Okay? And actually, when people print this thing, um, you can add a smart page break, and then it gives a separate page. Let me move it over here so you can see it. Um, let me do that again. I'm sorry, page break after each major grouping is the one you want to check. And then what happens is you get a separate page 
for each person. Uh, and unfortunately, I pressed print instead of print preview. So now I'm going to be printing all of those pages on my computer in a second. But anyway, um, the point that I want to make – oh, here it is up here. Whoops. Let me do this later. Uh, you'll get a separate page for each person. That feature is not new. That's been around for years, but I, I just threw it in. The new feature is if say you want to filter this thing to see who gave donations, individual donations between let's say a hundred and four hundred dollars. Maybe you want to do a special uh, a special you're trying to do some analysis and you want to see who donates within that range. Well, you can't really see that. I mean, if you do a sales by customer summary report, you can see the total, but you don't get to see it based on individual donations. Here you can see individual donations, but you can't quickly see who gave individual donations between 100 and 400. And the reason why is because you couldn't filter for a range when it comes to dollar amount. New in 2018, when I click Customize and I click Filter, there's a new filter under Amount. See this thing where you can make it equal to or greater than or less than a certain amount? This is what's new. It was new last year. You can filter for a range. Please show me all the transactions on this report that are between $100 and $400 and then it filters the report down, and you only see the transactions between $100 and $400. So that, and you can use that filter thing on all kinds of reports where you can filter for a range. Okay? So, uh, and I think I just have one more little feature, and uh, this is kind of like my favorite little feature to teach. I'm going to go to Reports, and they added this last year. I'm going to go to a Standard Profit and Loss. So now listen with me carefully. This report is dated February 1st to February 13th. And that's why the reason why is because every time you pop up a standard P&L in QuickBooks, it automatically assumes you want the current month to date, right? Well, frequently when I pull up the report, it's because I'm trying to create a report for the board of directors and I need a year to date, not just the month to date. So I'm going to click on customize. I'm not at the new feature yet. Actually, I don't even need to click on Customize because it's a date range. I can just go straight from here. And you'll see something that says, This Fiscal Year to Date. Am I still here? I just heard a beep. Yeah, Hello? You're still, I, I can still hear you. Yeah, because I hear a yep. beeping. Anyway, okay. This Fiscal Year to Date. So I click it, and it gives me July 1 through today's date, February the 13th. Well, Frequently, you don't want to give a P&L to the board that is all the way through today's date. And the reason why is because you haven't reconciled through today. You haven't entered all the transactions. Frequently, you want it through the end of the previous month. So what you end up having to do is click on this, go back one, click here, and then you can print it. Well, that's kind of a pain in the butt. So new in 2018 or 17, they added a new feature called This Fiscal Year to Last Month. And now when you click it, it will always go from the beginning of the fiscal year. This, person, this nonprofit begins on July 1, and it goes through the last month, the last day of the last month, which is when you've reconciled. Now, the reason why this is so powerful is because if you created this report and perhaps you changed the title of it, you made some changes, um, and I'll just make a couple of changes. I'll just say board, uh, and now I'll say that here. And it's like I don't want to have to recreate this every time so I can memorize it. Well, if you memorized it, where before this, and you just had this fiscal year to date, and then you backdated it, when you memorized it, it would be a custom date, which means no matter even five years from now when you pulled it up, it would give you this date range. And you didn't want it for this date range. You want the date range to be fluid. You want to move to the 
current period that you're in. So now I can go uh, this fiscal year to last month, and then when you memorize that, and I'll just click Memorize and click OK, now two years from now when you're ready to pull up another report for the board, Reports, Memorized Reports, Profit and Loss for Board, it won't be uh, July 1 through 131. It will be whatever that date range is, you know, July 1, 2020 through 131 of 2020. So I think hopefully that made sense to you. And that is basically it for the new features. So let me stop for a second, take a couple questions. We've got about 10 more minutes left. Actually, you know what? I want to do a lot of questions. So let's do this. Let me go ahead and uh, let's share the uh, – I'm going to go ahead and go back to the slides. And I want to show you this uh, so that you can write this down. Because I can tell there's a lot of people on the call here that are going to definitely need some help. Um, so. If you are interested in coming to our three-day webinar series, it's two hours a day for three days. Uh, we're giving it to you. It's normally $200. We're giving it to you for $149. I'm going to do this real quick, and then don't get off the phone because we're going to take all sorts of questions. Um, if you have questions um, and you want to be able to talk to somebody, I don't know if you've tried to call into it, but they're not open on the, on the weekends. They're not open at night, and the, CPA, the people that are on there aren't usually CPAs or accountants. You can speak to one of us. Uh, it's normally uh, $499 to get a year of tech support. You're going to get it for $199, which is dirt cheap. You can call us any time, day or night. We can answer any questions that you have. We can look over your setup. We can even dial into your software. Okay. Now the last thing is the training product, and I would highly recommend that you get this. Now this is normally I think $229. You can get it at TechSoup for $109. It's five hours of learning a DVD that comes with a follow along handbook. All right? So write these codes down, and uh, Seema will send it out again. But you've got to go to QuickBooksMadeEasy.com in order to get it. So we'll go back to this. One more little poll for you. We have a newsletter that comes out once a month. It teaches you tips in QuickBooks. It's a little uh, online newsletter, and it gives you a little link to a YouTube video that shows you something new or interesting or maybe something old that people just don't know about in QuickBooks. If you are interested in this, please answer yes. And those of you that are a little worried about, don't worry. You're not going to be inundated with a bunch of sales emails. It's just this newsletter, and it's just me helping you out with QuickBooks. Uh, and it goes out on the 15th of each month. We're actually going to have one go out in two days. So go ahead and answer there. We've got around 480 people on the, on the webinar, so we're still waiting for people to answer. Uh, so we want everybody to answer either yes or no. And um, while that's going on here, can you uh, read me a couple of questions, and then we'll start with more questions. Sure. What do yeah. you got, so I think, Sina? Yep. So we have about six minutes left. So I think one question that we saw quite frequently uh, throughout the webinar was questions about the online um, versus desktop. So somebody said, I am still confused between online version and desktop. Does online work for nonprofits? Does it provide info to complete IRS Form 990? Okay. So um, the reason why you're confused is because everybody's confused. Um, does it work for nonprofits? Sure. Is it as good as the desktop version? No. The desktop version has more reporting capabilities, and it will allow you to split payroll between grants, uh, and programs, whereas the online edition will not. So if you have the desktop, stick with it. If you're in the online edition, hold on. It will get better over time, but it's okay. Either one of them is fine if you're a nonprofit. And does either one of them provide what you need to do the 990? It completely, yes, as long as you set it up correctly. If you don't set it up correctly, you won't get what you need. Okay. 
So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again so that I'm in QuickBooks when the rest of the questions come. And if it's okay with you, Seema, I want to stay on the call a few minutes late to make sure okay. that I have everybody's answered. Now, I saw somebody wanted to know when you use the other names list. So there are four names lists in QuickBooks. There's the customer list. That's where you put your donors, members, or students. There's the vendors list. That's where you put the people that you pay your money to. And everybody goes on that list that you pay money to except for people that are going to get a W-2 out of QuickBooks, which means your 1099 people go here. Your W-2 people go in the employee list. Why is there under lists, you'll see something called the other names list. This is where you put people when you don't know what the heck you're going to do with them yet. And I will tell you, I teach in the training. I put my volunteers here, and I track my volunteers. There's a chapter in one of the training products that teaches you how to use QuickBooks to track hours for volunteers and, and send letters to them and all that stuff. That's in the other names list. Next question. All right. So there's a lot of questions about thank you letters. Um, so let me so, show you real uh, yeah. quick about it. So here's what the deal is. We, I can't show you everything about it, but what people are wondering is when you enter a transaction on a sales receipt, and this is where you're supposed to enter your donations. Okay, And uh, let me go back to one that's an actual donation. Here's one for $50. Now, um, let me make sure I'm in the right data file. Uh, yes, all right. So when you go to print this thing or email it, the one that QuickBooks gives you looks like this. So what people are wondering, and you may have seen me do this before, is you can create your own template. I created one here that I called Thank You Letter, so that when it comes out of the printer or is attached to an email, it actually looks like this. And you can also add your logo to it, uh, and you can make it long paragraphs. So what I teach people how to I teach people how to do that in the Beyond the Essentials training product. That's the same place where the volunteers are are, uh, are taught. And but just real quickly, you go under lists, templates, and you don't want to. You basically create your own template. So I've already created it. So you just go over here and click New. But I've created one, and I'll edit it. But if you go to the additional customization, this is where you basically take things off of the report that you're not interested in. And then the layout designer is where you make it pretty, and you add things like your logo. I'm going to go ahead and add my logo here. Add image. And then you've got to find where your, where your logos are, and then you can add them. And uh, let me see if I can see where mine are real quick. Uh, beyond class, and probably there. There's a logo. There you go. So here's the logo, and then you can click and you can move it up there. And so this is how you can create your thank you letter. Now, I could go on forever and a day about this, but um, it's in the training product. See, now it has our little logo on it. That's kind of cool. But. Uh, if you go to QuickBooks Made Easy, uh, which this is where you're going to go to order the products, but uh, there's a whole training product uh, that is called the Essentials. That one's 229, but you're getting it at TechSoup for 109. But then the Beyond the Essentials training product for nonprofits, this is where. Uh, you learn how to do that right here, this product right here. So uh, who else has a question for me? All right. So we have time for probably about one more question. Um, let's see. Okay, customer invoice question. If you receive a payment against which work will be done, is there an invoice template that shows the payment on the invoice? Our invoice shows if they still have a credit balance after the invoice, but it doesn't show the payment. Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah. She, we showed you this before actually a little while ago, but I'll show it to you again. What he's saying is um, – let me just go to an invoice or she. Uh, so here's a member of $710. So let's say the person just partially pays. Sherry Bonus. Let me receive a payment for Bona. 
Sherry. And this thing is, and there's one more thing that I want to, I forgot. The, uh, where is this? Oh, I've got to save this invoice first. All right. Um, what happened here? Maybe that wasn't an invoice. I can't remember. Let's do a new invoice here. Yeah, that was a sales receipt. So let's do, okay, here's an invoice for $100. So I'm going to save this invoice. And then I will receive a payment against it. And Adams, there we go. But I'll only receive a payment for 20 so that means the other 80 is outstanding. So you can see on the screen here that it's telling you the payment, but he's saying that when I go to print it, the payment doesn't appear. See? It just has the payment. So if you ever run into problems like that, it has to do with the formatting of the template again. So uh, I will just, let's see, I'll go to this one. All right. And in the footer, this is where you can add the payments. Right there. And here's the balance due. So of course, it's, you have to go into the Layout Designer to pretty it up. So then we've got to go into the Layout Designer and move it around a little bit to make it a little bit prettier. So here's the payment, here's the balance due. So you'd want to move this around so that it's, it's giving you what you need. Um, but that's basically where you go to do it. And I, unfortunately, I don't have time to move it around. But that's where your answer is. It's in the actual, I mean, I'll pre preview this, but it looks ridiculous now because I have to move these boxes around. Uh, the only other thing that I'll say and then we'll be done is, let me go back to the sharing here, is the, all right, this sale ends Thursday at midnight Pacific Standard Time. So you got two days. But um, I'll let you take us home, Seema. Uh, how did everybody feel, by the way? Is, how, is everybody cool? Give me a chat and let me see what you all think. It's kind of weird. We did just new features, but um, I want to see if anybody – oh, good. Jenny thought it was awesome. Good. Uh, Mary thought it was okay. So Mary, tell me how to make it better for you. I want to know. Uh, anyway, all right. Awesome. All right. Oh, and Joseph's so coming on Thursday. Yes. Sure. That was super informative. Thank you, everyone, for staying on for an hour and a half. Um, just want to close out real quick. If you have questions about TechSoup and um, our partnership with Intuit, you can go to um, TechSoup.org slash Intuit. Again, these are the products that are available. Um, eligibility requirements are also listed here. If you have any questions, feel free you know, to follow up with us afterwards, and we will try and answer um, any questions you might have. Um, so just to finish up today's webinar, um, if you want to chat one thing that you learned uh, from um, Greg today in the chat box, that would be good for him to see and good for us to know. Also, we have a post-event survey. So your feedback is super helpful to us, and it helps dictate a lot of content that we provide in the future. So if you could take a few extra minutes, I believe there's about 10 questions on there. Um, it's really valuable for us to know you know, what you learned and what you'd like to see in the future. We're also on social media. So if you guys are on Facebook, on Instagram, Twitter, and you want to follow along what we post on our blog, or if we have any upcoming webinars, that's a great place to do that. We also have a blog, which is blog.techsoup.org, where we post a lot of valuable um, tips and tricks on different technologies that we partner with. And then also we have another webinar coming up on Thursday with Greg again, which is QuickBooks Premiere for new desktop users. So if you guys enjoyed today's content, um, we'd love to see you there again on Thursday. And then we have a webinar on Amazon Web Services happening on 227. And then on 228 we have a, another webinar on data visualization and how you can use data to track uh, social change. So lastly, I just want to thank our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk. Um, again, 
If you guys want to watch the webinar again, we're going to email it after the webinar is over, and we'll link to the recording and to the handout um, and any relevant information. So thank you again, Greg, for your presentation. And thanks for attending. I popped this up. People were saying they needed it again. But I think you send it anyway. Um, yeah, so they can get I'll the send the handout. <laughs> Okay. And be sure yep. you understand, if you want the training product, QuickBooks Made Easy the Essential, get that from TechSoup. So you go to the TechSoup website. And then the tech support and the three-day webinar series that we're doing, which is two hours a day for three days, it's awesome. Uh, that's the, that's the, you go to QuickBooks Made Easy site for that. Perfect. Thank you.